Bertrand van der Laan and others, and to the Caribbean Limited Essential Company and Bitcoin Association for BSC and others, and to the Caribbean Limited Essential Company for Van der Laan and others. Yes, Mr. Morrell. Good morning, my lords. I appear for the appellant with Mr. Friedman and Ms. Carmichael, the original respondents, by which I mean Ds 2 to 12 and Ds 15 to 16, are represented by my learned friend Mr. Ramsden. Yes. D 14, represented by my learned friends Mr. Charlton and Mr. Koo. D 14, uh, yeah. D 14, yes. D right. 13 hasn't participated. Yeah. Claim against D1 is settled. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that we've read the skeleton arguments and the judge's judgment. That's helpful. Um, we would like to know whether we are to consider the original particulars of claim or the amended particulars of claim. Both. Both. Are you applying to amend? No formal application before you, but if I need to make one, I'll make one. I'll yes. explain, explain why I don't think I need to make one. And I'll, uh, and, and I'll get to that. I have a vague point. feeling that you're entitled to amend before the defence has been served. Yes. My Lord, the appeal, as you know, the appeal in relation to the original respondents is against the judgment of Mrs Justice Falcon yes. delivered in March this year. Lady Justice Andrews, who gave permission to appeal that judgment, directed that the appeal against the subsequent decision of Mrs Justice Falk in relation to D14, which effectively mirrored her earlier judgment, should be heard at the same time as, yeah. as the primary appeal, on the basis that D14 is in a materially identical position as the uh, original respondents. We've agreed a timetable. Essentially, I propose to address the court until 4 p.m. today, unless I finish earlier, uh, and will be given half an hour to reply tomorrow. Yes. If invited to make submissions, D14 will share the time allotted to the original respondents. But presumably that's something that can be dealt with after I've sat down. What, I'm sorry, why invited? If, I mean, if they're respondents to an appeal, they're invited. That, that's what they say in their skeleton. I right. think you'd better ask them to elucidate that. Well, my lord, the order that was made and by it, Lady Justice yes, Lady Justice Andrews directed that it be a matter for this court oh, I see. as yes. to whether this court wanted to hear from D14. So, my lords, we say this case is the first time that the English courts, or indeed any courts in the common law world, had to grapple with the question whether the software developers behind di digital currency networks owe duties to owners of digital currency recorded on those networks. The issues raised are of fundamental importance to TTL itself, which owns digital assets of, su of substantial value that it can no longer access, as well as to the financial world generally. Few people fully understand how cryptocurrency networks operate, yet they are the foundation of a global crypto economy that's exploded over the last decade. Cryptocurrencies are now mainstream, invested in by pension funds and other institutional investors, as well as by businesses and ordinary consumers, including millions of consumers, or millions of investors rather, in the United Kingdom. All of these owners are susceptible increasingly sophisticated hacks and could find themselves in the same position as TTL. TTL claims that the respondents owe its fiduciary duties and a duty of care and tort to take all reasonable steps to assist it in regaining access to its digital assets recorded on the networks. Access it lost when its private keys were deleted, <coughs> presumably stolen in a computer hack. Our primary submission for this court is that our case on both fiduciary duties and duty of care is more than fanciful, and for that reason the judge erred. That's grounds four and five. In the alternative, we say that the duties claimed are highly fact-dependent, and that this is a paradigm case of a developing difficult and uncertain area of law in respect to which summary determination is inappropriate. For that reason alone, we say there is a serious issue to be tried. That's ground one. Further, our position is that in concluding that no duties can arise, the judge made various, made various errors of law, that's grounds four and five, and wrongly relied on, on certain facts, that's grounds two and three.
Finally, we reject the suggestion that we need to amend our claim. But even if the court disagrees with that proposition, we should be permitted to amend in line with the overriding objective. And the lack of a formal application before this court does not matter. We also note that we only need to persuade your lordships that there is a serious issue to be tried in respect of one of the claim duties, the service out of the jurisdiction of the committee. Albeit we accept, of course, that in that event we are only entitled to permission in respect of that part of the claim. In terms of a roadmap for my submissions today, I propose to start by setting out our positive case on fiduciary duty, which is essentially the first part of ground four, before then turning to ground one, summary determination, and then moving on to ground three, the law commission point, followed by the balance of ground four, errors of analysis in relation to the question of whether or not fiduciary duties are owed. I'll then move on to ground two, impermissible impermissible reliance on facts, and then deal with ground six, our alternative case, whether there's a need to amend, and finally, ground five, duty of care. Now, dealing first with our positive case on fiduciary duties, that's set out in our skeleton argument of paragraphs 62 to 65, but I want to start with the legal principles. Now, the learned judge summarised some of the law on fiduciary duties from paragraphs 53 through to 62 of her judgment, which you can find at core tab 13, starting at page 151. <clears throat> yes. And what I propose to do is to build on what the learned judge says and draw from that what we say is the proper approach to determining when ad hoc fiduciary duties should be imposed. Now, at paragraph 54, the learned judge cited the well-known de definition of fiduciary set out by Lord Justice Millett in Bristol and West Building Society in Moshe. And the relevant passage is is set out in full in paragraph 54, a fiduciary is someone who's undertaken to act for or on behalf of another in a particular matter and circumstances which give rise to a relationship of trust and confidence. The distinguishing obligation of a fiduciary is the obligation of loyalty. The principle is entitled to a single-minded loyalty of his fiduciary. Now, that description, as I'm sure you're well aware, has been widely cited by the higher court since then and has been approved by the Supreme Court in the case of FHR European Ventures and Mancarius. That's not in the bundle, but confirmation that that's been approved will see a paragraph 158 of the Al Nahan and Kent case, which I'll take you to in due course. The various other authorities the judge went on to reference shed light on how the constituent parts of the formulation in Moshi are properly to be understood. And I will discuss each of these elements in turn by reference to some of the key authorities. First of all, the reference is to someone who's undertaken to act for or on behalf of another in a particular matter. This identifies what is required of the fiduciary. Simply, is undertaken a relevant role in relation to the principle. It's only necessary for the fiduciary to have accepted doing the particular role. He doesn't have to have accepted responsibility or required standard of behaviour which the law ultimately says accompanies that role and imposes upon the fiduciary. At paragraph 60 of her judgment, if you've still got that open, Now on page 153, the judge recognised this important distinction, which has been highlighted in the authorities applying Moshu, and she refers there both to Vivendi and Richards as an F&C alternative investments, and she quotes from the judgment of Mr. Justice Sales, as he then was, from F&C investments, 
saying fiduciary duties or obligations imposed by law as a reaction to particular circumstances of responsibility assumed by one person in respect to the conduct of the affairs of another. And what I would like to show you is the preceding paragraph in Vivendi and Richards dealing with the question whether the duty is an imposed one or an accepted one. Now you'll find, you all can ask, are you all working on hard copy authority bundles? You'll find that in the second volume of the agreed authority bundles, at tab 24. <coughs> Don't worry, Mr. Wardell. I will stay. <coughs> I'll use the electronic ones, but I'll keep up. Well, on the electronic ones, you just need to go to page 904, top of the page. And at paragraph 138, Mr. Justice Newey, as he then was, says this. First of all, he cites from the full court of the Federal Court of Australia in Grimaldi, but said there remains no generally agreed and unexceptional, unexceptionable definition of a fiduciary. The court, which included Mr. Justice Finn, went on to say the following description suffices for present purposes. A person will be in a fiduciary relationship with another when and insofar as that person has undertaken to perform such a function for or has assumed such a responsibility to another as would thereby reasonably entitle that other to expect that he or she will act in that other's interest to the exclusion of his or her own or a third party's interest. And rather early in his career, as Justice Finn, as Professor Finn, had said this in the fiduciary principle, overpaid, I think we can pick it up seven lines <coughs> in, after he's de dealt with Professor Austin Scott's definition, he goes on to say that this is in the end unhelpful. A fiduciary responsibility ultimately is an imposed, not an accepted one. If one needs an analogy here, one is closer to tort law than to contract. One is concerned with an imposed standard of behaviour. The factors which lead to that imposition doubtless involve recognition of what the alleged fiduciary duty has agreed to do. But equally, public policy considerations can ordain what he must do, whether this be agreed to or not. This emerges most clearly in those cases where the fiduciary principle is used to protect property and near property interests, and in the de facto fiduciary relationship cases. And the re relevance of equity acting in a way that accords with public policy considerations has been flagged in our skeleton argument of paragraph 65 and I'll return to that later. So that's the fir first part of the test in Mothu. The second part is in circumstances which give rise to a relationship of trust and confidence. And there are two issues here. First, the foundational role of circumstances, and secondly, the meaning of a relationship of trust and com confidence. In respect to the first issue, Clearly, the dependency of the test on circumstances means that the question as to whether fiduciary duties exist, as well as their scope, is highly fact-specific. And this is a point made by the judge, who still got her judgment open, paragraph 59, electronic bundle, page 153, by her, when she referred to Lady Arden's comment and Letty Markey and Cooper which is sometimes referred to in the judgment as the Chilton Investment Fund Foundation case. Uh, for consistency, I'll refer to it as Letty Markey and Cooper. Um, and when referring to this, we say she th then gave insufficient weight to the point when deciding that she was in a position to determine summarily that the claim duties don't exist. And this is because it's long been established that the application of the fiduciary doctrine requires a meticulous examination of the facts of each case. And as was stated in the well-regarded Australian case of Hospital Products and United States Search Corp, the scope of fiduciary duties is moulded according to the nature of the relationship and the facts of the case. And we see that if you go to agreed authorities, 
bundle 1, tab 10, electronic bundle 377. One ten, yeah. These. <coughs> and the number in the electronic bundle at the top <coughs> matches the numbering in red at the bottom of the bundles. So where are we going in hospital parts? We are going to page one oh two under the heading halfway down the page, the scope of the fiduciary duty. Yeah. The categories of fiduciary relations are infinitely varied and the duties of the fiduciary vary with the circumstances which generate the relationship. Fiduciary relationships range from the trustee to the errand boy, the celebrated example given by Lord Justice Fletcher Moulton in his judgment in Ray Coomba, in which after referring to the danger of trusting to verbal formulae, he pointed out that the nature of the cruel intervention which is justifiable will vary from case to case. In accordance with these comments, it's now acknowledged generally the scope of the fiduciary duty must be moulded according to the nature of the relationship and the facts of the case. And in respect to the second sub-issue, the relationship of trust and confidence, that's been characterised in other authorities as a legitimate expectation on the part of the principal that the fiduciary will act in his best interest. Born of the trust, the principal must necessarily place in the fiduciary by reason of the circumstances. Equity recognises this legitimate expectation and acts upon it. Now, the learned judge noted this characterisation, referring in paragraphs 56 to 58 of her judgment, starting on page 52, predicted to that effect, first of all, paragraph 56, an ARCLO investment. Well, and the ARCLO investment of paragraph 56. Yes. A situation where one person is in a relationship with another which gives rise to a legitimate expectation which equity will recognise that the fiduciary will not utilise his or her position in such a way which is adverse to the interest of the principal. And that formulation was also referred to Lord Justice Kitchen and Matara and Miller. She then goes on to deal with uh, Lettermarkey and Cooper. And first of all, in the Court of Appeal, a person will be in a fiduciary relationship with another when and insofar as that person is undertaken to perform such a function for as assumed such a responsibility for another as would thereby reasonably entitle that other to expect that he or she will act in that other's interest to the exclusion of his or own or third party's interest. And then the same case in the Supreme Court, Lady Arden said this in paragraph 45, the distinguishing obligation of fiduciary is that he must act only for the benefit of another in matters covered by his, by his fiduciary duty. This means he cannot at the same time act for himself. She went on to comment on the Court of Appeals formulation of 48. This formulation introduced the additional concept of reasonable expectation of abnegation of self-interest. Reasonable expectation may not be appropriate in every case, but it is with that qualification consistent with the duty of single-minded loyalty. Now, the authorities, my lords, make it clear that this type of relationship and expectation arises objectively on the facts where the fiduciary is in a position to exercise power or discretion to the detriment of his principle. And in the Supreme Court of Canada, Canada case of Lack Minerals and International Corona, the Supreme Court there formulated a helpful three-limb test identifying factual circumstances where fiduciary duties should be imposed. And we can pick, pick that up in the additional authorities bundle, that's the appellant's authorities bundle, it's tab 8. And we start at page 253. Judgment of 
of love, just love for it. And halfway down the page, on beneath the divide, he refers to Professor Ernest Weinrib article, fiduciary obligations, the hallmark of fiduciary relation is that the relative legal positions are such that one party is at the mercy of the other's discretion. Earlier he puts the point in the following way, where there is a fiduciary obligation <coughs> or a relation in which the principal's interests can be affected by and are therefore dependent on the manner in which the fiduciary uses the discretion which has been delegated to him. The fiduciary obligations are the blunt tool for the control of his discretion. I make no comment upon whether this description is broad enough to embrace all fiduciary obligations. I do agree, however, that where by statute, agreement, or perhaps by unilateral undertaking, one party has an obligation to act for the benefit of another, and that obligation comes with it at discretion of the country. <coughs> the party thus empowered becomes a fiduciary. Equity will then supervise the relationship by holding him to the fiduciary's strict standard of conduct. It's sometimes said that the nature of fiduciary relationships both established and exhausted by the standard categories of agent, trustee, partner, director, and the like. I don't agree. It's in the nature of the relationship, not the specific category of actor involved, that gives rise to the fiduciary duty. The categories of fiduciary, like those of negligence, should not be considered on close. And the bottom of the page refers to judgment Wilson J where she found there are common features discernible in the context in which fiduciary duties have been found to exist. And these common features do provide a rough and ready guide to whether or not the imposition of a fiduciary obligation on a new relationship would be appropriate and consistent. Relationships in which a fiduciary obligation has been imposed seem to possess three general characteristics. One, the fiduciary has scope for the exercise of some discretion or power. Two, the fiduciary can unilaterally exercise that power of discretion so as to affect the beneficiary's legal or practical interests. And three, the beneficiary is peculiarly vulnerable to or at the mercy of the fiduciary in the discretion or power. And if we can now go on to the judgment of Sapinka J at 285, <coughs> you'll see towards the bottom of the first main paragraph he also uh, cites the same test. Now, this test has been deployed on numerous occasions by the English courts. Examples include the decision of Lord Justice Morritt giving the judgment of the Court of Appeal in Rex Goose and Wilf Wilson Sanford, which you find at um, additional authorities, that's the appellant's authorities at tab six. We can pick it up at page eight, at page one seven four. And he refers at paragraph eighty one at the bottom right hand corner of one seventy four that Mr Justice Rymer decided there was no fiduciary duty owed by Brave to Goose. That was sufficient reason to reject Mr Goose's claim. He referred to the decision of Love Forest J in Lack Minerals. And the passage from the judgment of Wilson J, to which he referred, in which the common features of relationships giving rise to fiduciary duties were identified. They were one, the fiduciary scope for the exercise of some discretion or power, two, the type fiduciary can unilaterally exercise that power or discretion so as to affect the beneficiary's legal or practical interest, and three, the beneficiary is peculiarly vulnerable to act or at the mercy of the fiduciary holding the discretion or power. And the, Mr. Justice Reimer considered that none of these features existed in the relation between Mr. Bray and Mr. Goose. You see that the judge also quoted with approval that passage from this Professor Finn's book that I've already taken on to. Does Lord Justice Morritt approve that? Yes. Where? He's just reciting at the moment. The paragraph you just showed us, he's just reciting what the trial judge decided. But does he say that was right? 85. 85. Yes. Thus, Mr. Goose alleged that the joint venture and associated fiduciary duties arose in March and April 84, but at that stage there was no complete agreement, there was no embarkation. I see, yeah. Yes, etc. Yes, he does seem to apply that. Yes. yes. And it was also, we haven't gotten the bundle, it was also approved or applied with approval by Mr. Justice Voss, as he then was, that's the case of Global Energy, Horizons and Grey, 
citation is 2012 EWHC 3703. And Lord Justice Leggett, sitting as a High Court judge in Al Nehan and Kent, approved a similar analysis by Mr Justice May Mason in his well-regarded judgment in the Australian case that I've already referred to of hospital products and the United States surgical. Can we go back to that in the first bundle of the agreed authorities and pick it up at page 371? Sorry, which page? Page 371. Thank you. And it's started. Was HPI a fiduciary? Because distributor manufacturers not an established fiduciary relationship is important to ascertain the characteristics which, according to tradition, identify a fiduciary relationship. As the courts have declined to define the concept, of going to to develop the law in a case-by-case -case approach, you have to distill the essence of, or the characterization of the relationship from the illustrations which you, you, the judicial decisions provide. In so doing, we must recognize that the categories are not closed. The accepted fiduciary relationships are sometimes referred to as relationships of trust and confidence, or confidential relations, viz trustee and beneficiary, agent and principal, solicitor and client, employee and employer director and company and partners. The critical feature of these relationships, this is the important passage, is that the fiduciary <coughs> undertakes or agrees to act for or, not, or for or on behalf of or in the interest of another person in the exercise of a power or discretion which will affect the interest of that other person in a legal or practical sense. The relationship between the parties is therefore one which gives the fiduciary a special opportunity to exercise the power of discretion to the detriment of that other person who is accordingly vulnerable to abuse by the fiduciary of his position. The expressions for on behalf of and the interests of signify that the fiduciary acts in a representative character in the exercise of his responsibility when adopting an expression used by the Court of Appeal. And it's partly because the fiduciary's exercise of the power of discretion <coughs> can adversely affect the interest of the person to whom the duty is owed, and because the latter is at the mercy of the former, the fiduciary comes under a duty to exercise his power or discretion in the interest of the person to whom it is owed. And the, the power or discretion, is that something which arises by agreement? No, it arises as a result of the role undertaken by the person said to be the fiduciary. That goes back to the, the fact that the relationship is one imposed rather than being accepted. Right. I mean, it has to be a relationship of some sort. Of course. There has to be a role undertaken, and that's fundamental. Yep. And if, if by looking at the role it's quite clear that the person exercising that role does have power, does have that discretion, is a so that the, the beneficiary or the principal is at his mercy, then equity imposes the obligation. So if we just go back for a moment to the Canadian case you referred us to, Lack and Correa. Yes, of course can. We'll Looking at Justice back. Wilson's three-pronged test at um, tab 8254 <coughs> of your additional authorities. Yes. Um, just map that, if you would, onto the facts as you say they are. I'm in coming this case. to the facts. Can I duck that question for the moment? I want to set out all the principles first, then I'm going to apply them to the facts of all this right. case, so you can then understand why why we say a, a fiduciary duty is in fact owed to you. Whilst on the hospital products case, then we go on to the judgment of Mr. Justice Daw Dawson, which we find at authorities ten. That's the agreed authorities, 10, page 417. And half 
halfway down the page, paragraph starting the difficulty, we can pick it up at line four. There is, however, the notion underlying all the cases of fiduciary obligation that inherent in the nature of the relationship itself is a position of disadvantage or vulnerability on the part of one of the parties which causes him to place reliance upon the other and requires the protection of equity acting upon the conscious of, conscience of that other. See Tatum Williamson. Um, Lord, for completeness, it's worth noting that a legitimate expectation is not said to arise in contractual relations where one party is simply relying on the other to fulfil to fulfil his contractual obligation. This is an observation made by Lord Justice Leggett in the Kent case. I wanted to take you to. I don't think that that's a paragraph one six four to five. I don't think you need to look that up. Uh, and applying the analysis in lack minerals and hospital products, a contractual party cannot properly be said to be at the mercy of its counterparty in respect of whether or not the counterparty. This contract because the part that first party can avail himself of his contractual remedies in the event of a breach. So different considerations apply where there's a contractual relationship. My lords, the final element of the Matthew formulation is the, the distinguishing obligation of single-minded loyalty that's imposed on a fiduciary by reason of his principles, legitimate expectations regarding his conduct. And as Lord Justice Millet explained at 18b of Mothy, this core duty has several facets. One of those being that a fiduciary may not act for the benefit of a third person without, without the informed consent of his principal. Now, I've already shown you uh, the, the extract from Gr Grimaldi that was approved in the case of Avendi. The same passage in Grimaldi was also approved by the Court of Appeal in Letty Mark in Cooper in the Court of Appeal. Now, the Court of Appeal decision is not in the bundle, but the approval we can get from Lady Arden's judgment in the Supreme Court, which we find in page 506, that's tab 14 of the agreed bundle. And you can see there, paragraph 47 of Lady Arden's judgment, which refers to the fact that the Court of Appeal adopted the following test put forward by Finn J. Ingramaldi. And I've already given, <coughs> given, taken you through the quote. I don't need to repeat it. Yeah. So, as such, we say it can be said, firstly, the duty of loyalty requires a fiduciary to act in his principal's best interest, the exclusion of his own self-interest. And secondly, that the duty of loyalty also requires a fiduciary to act in his principal's best interest, the exclusion of the interest of third parties, and not necessarily his other principal. Now, turning to apply those princ legal principles to TTL's case, put simply, our factual case is as follows. TTL owns the digital assets in question, which are recorded on the network. However, TTL has lost access to and control of its digital assets following deletion and presumably theft of its private keys in a hack by an unknown third party. The respondent developers each voluntarily control the operation of the network by way of their control of the software code that governs the network's operation. They dictate and often write the updates to this code from time to time. And they earn money from this role through sponsorship by third parties. The respondent's voluntary control of the software code governing the network gives them the power to dictate and discretion to decide, first of all, who has access to and control 
of digital assets recorded on those networks. Whether that be the owners of the assets in question, e.g. TTL, third parties or themselves. Secondly, they ha have the power to take the <coughs> discretion to decide how such access and control may be achieved. And thirdly, the scope of that access and control. In other words, what may be done with the digital assets. By contrast, TTL has no power at all to influence how the network's recording its digital assets operate. And no prospect of regaining access to its digital assets without the respondent's assistance following the theft of its private keys. The respondents are each capable of writing software code that would allow TTL to regain access to and control of its digital assets. It is likely in practice the respondents could each take steps in respect to that updated code that would result in its being implemented across the networks so that TTL would regain access to and control of its assets. And as set out in paragraph 64 of our skeleton, TTL's position is that those facts show the following. First of all, the respondents have each undertaken a role pursuant to which they each exercise power and discretion that affects the interests of TTL in both a legal and practical sense. Secondly, they each have a special opportunity to exercise that power and discretion to the detriment of TTL by denying it access to and control of its digital assets. TTL can do nothing about this. It follows that TTL is at the respondent's mercy. Now it's notable that whilst this was said in, by the learned judge in the context of duty of care, she acknowledged that in some respects it could be said that TTL was at the mercy of the respondents. I get that from paragraph 98 of the judgment that you find in the court bundle, tab 13, page 161. I can see, the learned judge says this, I can see that it might be arguable that when making software changes, developers have assumed some level of responsibility to ensure that they take reasonable care not to harm the interests of users. For example, by introducing a malicious software bug or doing something else that compromises the security of the network. Further, if the defendants do control the networks as TTL alleges, it's conceivable that some duty might be imposed to address bugs or other defects that arise in the course of operation of the system and which threatens our operation. So we say, that the facts that I've set out objectively give rise to a legitimate expectation on the part of TTL that the respondents will act in its best interests to the exclusion of their own interests and the interests of third parties in respect of the code they write governing TTL's access to and control of its digital assets. Equity recognises this legitimate expectation and acts upon it by imposing fiduciary duty on the respondents to take all reasonable steps, including writing updated code for the network, to provide TTL with access to and control of its digital assets. Rather than allowing the respondents to take a stance that benefits third party fraudsters who are likely to be in a position to misappropriate TTL's assets. And as we set out in paragraph 65 of our skeleton argument, there are strong public policy arguments for reuniting TTL with its valuable assets and for requiring the respondents who are in control of a multi-billion dollar global financial system used by tens of millions of persons to act in the best interests of TTL rather than the interest of third party fraudsters. Um, it may assist the court when it's 
considering our positive duty, our fiduciary duties, to think of a very simple analogy. Let's imagine that person A built a safe and invited person B to use it because it's all valuable, which could be dealt with him by him at any moment using the key to the safe, which is given by person A. A and B don't enter into a contract. Person A is the manufacturer of the safe, is in a position to change the safe's lock or to use a master key to open the safe and take person B's valuables. And person B is not in a position to prevent A from doing so. Person B has no other way of ever accessing his valuables without the key. He cannot physically break into the safe, for example. If person B has his key stolen, he'll be powerless to stop the thief using his key from accessing the safe. If person B has his key stolen, he could legitimately expect A to assist him by changing the lock and giving him a new key, or using a master key to access the safe to allow him to move his assets to safety, rather than one, locking him from ever retrieving his valuables, and two, knowing, uh, knowingly allowing the third party thief ready access to the valuables. I find that quite a difficult analogy. If I buy a safe and I lose the key, what duty has the seller or the manufacturer to supply me with another one? Well, you're looking at a, you're giving an example of a contract. I'm, I, I'm deliberately avoiding the contractual analogy. It's the question of power. If the power it's, not, it's not a question of you just buying a safe and taking it home and you having control of it. The, different, the key distinction here is that the person from whom you've acquired access to the safe retains complete control over it. Still in his dom domain, he has the master key, he can abuse his position. That's the key distinction. That the developers owe fiduciary duties is a view that's been expressed in academic literature. That was dealt with by the judge in her judgment at paragraph 66 which we find at C, tab 13, page 154. Which it says this, TTL points to some support for the existence of fiduciary duties in academic literature. The defenders dispute this, relying on other academic literature challenging that. Although I've read the rival written submissions about this, I've not found it helpful to focus on the literature. It's not written from an English legal perspective, and furthermore, the existence of serious academic dispute does not assist the defendant's case. But the application of the relevant legal principles in this case are anything other than, than controversial and in a developing area. The, so the judge, as we read it, makes two points. The first is against TTL, and she dismisses the relevance of the literature because she says it's not written from an English law legal perspective. And the second point was to correctly note that the academic dispute does make clear that the point is controversial and in a developing area. I'll come back to that second point when I deal with ground one in due course. Focusing on the first point, we said the judge was wrong to dismiss the academic literature. Now we rely on a paper written by Professor Walsh, which I'll take you to in a moment, called Encoders We Trust, Software Developers Are Fiduciaries. Now, it's also correct, and I'll take you to that in a moment, it's also correct there's a paper written, cited by the original respondents that disagrees with that view, published in the Stanford Journal of Blockchain Law and Policy, entitled Blockchain Development and Fiduciary Duty, written by Professor Rainer Hack. That's the right way to pronounce the name. Apologies if it's not. Um, we say it's hardly a promising <coughs> starting point for the original response to argue that in showing that TTL doesn't have a case that's even plausible, they say they found one academic article that disagrees with another academic article that says developers do owe fiduciary duties. We say the fact there was academic support for the general proposition that developers are, are fiduciaries does, of course, show that there was a plausible basis for such a contention. And even in the Hague article, that makes it clear there was a scholarship other than Walsh 
that supports the position of developers of high duties. We can see that from the agreed authorities bundle, tab 32, page 1034. The last paragraph on that page. The author says this. It may be tempting to advocate for fiduciary obligation on all of blockchain developers subsequent to a major exploitation of the token transfer and code used by the DAO, which split the prominent Ethereum blockchain community into two and resulted in token value volatility. Some scholarship promoted for use. One scholar summarized by the title of her article called Blockchain Will Developers What They Are by Jewish. Now that that up. That article was an earlier article by Walsh, but if you look at footnote 36, you can see that his other scholarship referred to that, other than just Walsh. And returning to the, the judge's rejection of the relevance of the academic literature, the sole basis for her rejection appears to be have been that she said that literature wasn't written from an English law perspective. We said that was a flawed analysis. And this is because the same basic principles apply in relation to fiduciary duties in the present case as were referenced in the article. And she didn't point to any difference of principle that would have rendered the consideration of the question unsafe. And the Walsh article, in fact, states at footnote 38, can we look at tab 31, page 1009? And you'll f see heading it looks like a fiduciary. And second sen third sentence there, the first paragraph, when using a general definition of fiduciary, certain developers of public blockchain show a strong resemblance. And that's footnoted at 38, where she says that this isn't a jurisdiction-specific legal argument, but rather a consideration of broad conception of a fiduciary. I am not claiming in a particular jurisdiction to call developers or dominant minors to be considered by duties based on that jurisdiction's existing law. And, and notably, the article bases the analysis on four principles, which we find from page from the next page, page one zero one zero. And the four principles come from Professor Frankel pioneering and leading scholar in the states and fiduciary law has written that all fiduciaries share the following attributes. One, offer mainly services in contrast to products. The services that fiduciaries offer are usually socially desirable and often require expertise, such as healing, legal services, teaching, asset management, corporate management, and retail services. Two, in order to perform these services effectively, fiduciaries must be entrusted with property or power. Three, entrustment poses to entrustors the risk that the fiduciaries will not be trustworthy. They may misappropriate the entrusted property or misuse the entrusted property, or they will not perform the promised services adequately. Four, there is likelihood that it, A, the entrustor will fail to protect itself from the risks involved in fiduciary relationships, B, the markets may fail to protect entrustors from these risks, and C, the cost of the fiduciaries of establishing their trustworthiness may be higher than their benefits from the relationship. And we say, my lords, and she goes on to expand on, 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 on all, the, all, the, all those four categories in, in the next pages, all of which have been underlined or sidelined in red. I wasn't going to take you through them. But you might be interested in reading them in due course. But we say those four basic principles are not materially different from English law principles and certainly not in a way that it would allow the judge simply to, to dismiss the academic dispute as being irrelevant. On the contrary, we say the academic support for TTL's case is relevant and goes to establishing that there is a serious question to be tried. Indeed, where there is a live academic debate on the subject, we say it's self-evident that the position contended for has real prospects of, of success. 
and needs to be determined in the light of the full facts at trial. My Lords, that's the first part of ground four. I'll come later to, to deal with what we say are particular errors in the learned judge's analysis, but what I want to do now is go on to ground one, uh, whereby we submit that this, on any view, is unsuitable to stand in for termination. And ground one is that the judge failed to apply the well-established principle that a court should not consider itself in a position to determine that a claim is bound to fail or discloses no serious issue to be tried, where such determination turns on an exceptionally difficult and doubtful point of law, doubtful in this context, meaning uncertain. As I'll come on to submit, we say it's plain that the point here falls within such a category. Uh, before I doing that, I is it a difficult or doubtful point of law? Isn't it a question of whether well-established equitable principles accommodate a new set of facts, if you like, which equity has not had to encounter before? Is it yes, but it's the question of whether the facts are, the facts are unclear and complex. Hmm. And yes, I, I think that's probably a better way of putting it. Whether or not it is it. There should be an extension, but that brings it within the category of a developing area of law. It's not a point that's been considered before. But the question is, should the well-established principles for deciding whether or not an, a, a, an ad hoc fiduciary relationship is owed, should they be applied to this, these new set of circumstances? Yeah. And that's never been addressed before. But I think you're right. I may say so. Um, I was going to ask you, what, what is the point of law? How would you define it? Well, the, the simple question is, do, fi do developers owe fiduciary duties to owners of digital assets? Is it, is it properly arguable that they do? And we say, by applying existing principles, plainly yes. Well, I think you, I think you say, well, the principles are well said. Um, and from time to time, the courts have to decide whether they apply to a novel set of facts. Yes. And when doing that, the court has to make the findings of fact first and shouldn't determine it on a summary basis. Mm. And that's the point we get out from the authorities that I'm about to take you to, Altimo and others. And we, so we say case is inherently unsuitable for summary determination if the facts are complex and, and are unclear. We also say inherently unsuitable for summary determination if you're seeking to apl apply facts to a novel area, albeit basic, basing your argument on well-established principles. Now, the original respondents argue, and before I get there, there is a difference between us as to what the correct legal position is. We need, you need to see what the original respondents argue at paragraph 17a of their skeleton, which is core tab 8, page 108. They say, in paragraph 17a, that the effect of the case is we will rely on is this, that whereas questions of law on jurisdiction applications are usually to be decided on the balance of probabilities, the facts are not clear, or the point of law exceptionally difficult or doubtful, the court will apply the lower standard of real prospect success. In other words, they're maintaining that the court will not grasp the nettle and decide the point, but rather ask whether a real prospect of success. And that's put in another way in their skeleton argument in paragraph 19 where they say the existence of difficulty or doubt cannot itself give rise to a serious issue to be tried. Hence, they argue that the only relevance of the complexity or novelty of a point is you simply is you apply a real prospect success test. And they say it's irrelevant to whether or not there are real prospects of success. And we say in response that that analysis is wrong and that the judge failed to appreciate that if a point of law is complex or novel, or in a developing and contro controversial area, that in and of itself is a reason why the threshold is met. 
Indeed, as I'll explain shortly, the authorities all refer to such points as being relevant to the threshold in being, being met, or to put it another way, because of the developing or complex nature of the question, it cannot be said that there is no real prospect of success. Can we start with the decision of Altimo Holdings and Kyrgyz mobile telephone, which you find in the Greed Authorities tab 2? We can pick it up on page 37. <coughs> We've got to start at paragraph 81. A question of law can arise on an application in connection with service out of the jurisdiction, and if the question of law goes to the existence of jurisdiction, the court will normally decide it rather than treating to the question whether it's a good argument or case. Because this appeal is concerned with the necessary or proper party provision, the question of the merits of the claim is relevant to the question whether the claim against B1 is bound to fail, and to the question whether there is a serious issue to be tried in relation to the claim against B2. There is no practical difference between the two tests, and they in turn are the same as the test for summary judgment. What is the position if the viability of the claim depends on a substantial issue of law? Is the court bound to decide at the stage of the application of set aside service out of the jurisdiction? The general rule is it's not normally appropriate in a summary procedure, such as an application to strike out or for summary judgment, to decide a controversial question of law in a developing area, particularly because it's desirable that the facts should be found so that any further development of the law should be on the be on the basis of actual and not hypothetical facts. That's Lonner and Fayed approving Dice and Attorney General. Subject, summary procedure ought not to be applied to an action involving serious investigation of ancient law. Questions of general importance. And aside from next case, where the law is not settled but is in a state of development, it's normally inappropriate to decide novel questions on hypothetical facts. And Barrett and Enfield and others. In the context of interlocutory injunctions, in the famous case of American Sinomid, it was held the court must be satisfied that the claim is not frivolous or vexatious. In other words, it was a serious question to be tried. It was no part of the court's function to decide difficult questions of law which call for detailed argument and mature consideration. Over page uh, paragraph 85, refer to sequencer, Lord Gosh said that if at the end of the day there remains a substantial question of fact or law, or both, arising on the facts disclosed by the affidavit which the plaintiff bona fide each side to try, the court should, as a rule, allow the service of the writ. The standard of proof in respect to the cause of action could broadly be stated whether on the affidavit evidence before the court there was a serious question to be tried. And if we can go on to 86 at D, maybe referring to the earlier case of the Brevo, Consequently, the observations of the members of the appellate committee are obiter, but although they do not all put it in the same way, the overall effect of the decision is that if the question is whether the claim against D1 is bound to fail on a question of law, it should be decided on the application for permission to serve D2, but not where there is an exceptionally difficult and doubtful point of law. And the fact that we are seeking to apply well-established principles to a new ad hoc relationship doesn't mean we're not dealing with a difficult and doubtful point of law because it hasn't been considered before. And, and we say from this there are only two possibilities. Either the court decides the point on the balance of probabilities or it cannot do so and hence there's a real prospect of success and the matter should be left to go to trial. Sorry, what is the court to decide on the balance of probabilities? Sorry? You said that we just, the court could decide something on the balance of probabilities. Well, a point of law, yes. Well, we don't decide points Sorry? of law on balances of probabilities. They, uh, we decide facts on balances well, of probabilities. Yes, you're quite right. But uh, there are two possibilities. Either the court decides the point of law, yes. or there is, if it's unable to do so because you're looking at a developing area of law, uh, it has to conclude that there is a serious question yeah. that needs to go to trial. I, mean, I think the way you put it is that unless we come to the conclusion that 
assuming all the facts in your favour, you are bound to fail, we should allow you to serve out. Exactly. That summarises my appeal in, in a sentence. Yeah. And the, the, the proper approach to the courts, as we say, well illustrated by the decision of Begum and Marin, that was an application for summary judgment. The leading judgment was given by Lord Justice Coulson. You can find that in the additional authorities at tab four. We can pick it up at page 105. It starts at 105. We pick it up at 106. In paragraph one. Reference to Mr. Justice Jay refusing the act, appellant's application for reverse summary judgment. He found it couldn't be said that the duty of care alleged on behalf of the respondent would certainly fail and it should be allowed to proceed to trial. In addition, they found on face of it the law of Bangladesh applied to the claim and that imposed a strict limitation period of one year which hadn't been complied with. The judge considered the arguments available to him. And at page 108, paragraph 14, and, and you can see in paragraph 14 that the claim concerned whether or not there was a duty of care arising out of the appellant's autonomous control of the sale of the vessel and the appellant's knowledge that as a result of that sale the vessel would be broken up in Bangladesh in highly dangerous working conditions that is in my view an unusual basis of claim and that was the only basis claim available. Can we go on to paragraphs 23 and 24 on page 110? The other principle relevant to the present appeal is it's not generally appropriate to strike out a claim on assumed facts in an area of developing jurisprudence. Decisions as to novel points of law should be based on actual findings of fact, Beef Harrow and British Airways. In that case, the Court of Appeal referred back to the decision of the House of Lords in Barrett, where Lord Brown and Wilkinson said this, In my speech in the Bedfordshire case, with which the other members of the House agreed, I pointed out that unless it was possible to give a certain answer to the question of whether the plaintiff's claim would succeed, the case was inappropriate for striking out. I further said in an area of law which is uncertain and developing, such as the circumstances in which a person could be held liable and negligent for the exercise of statutory duty or power, it's not normally appropriate to strike out. In my judgment, it's of great importance that such developments should be on the basis of actual facts found at trial, not on hypothetical facts assumed possibly wrongly to be true for the purpose of striking. And it goes on to say, at paragraph 24, to the Vedanta case, Uh, and he cites from Lord Briggs in the Vedanta case, Lord Briggs gave the only reasoned judgment to Vedanta. In paragraph 48, he said this, it might be thought that an assertion of a claim against Vedanta raised a novel and controversial issue of the common law of negligence made it inherently unsuitable for summary judgment. It's well settled that difficult issues of law at that time are best resolved once all the facts have been ascertained at the trial, rather than upon the necessarily abbreviated and hypothetical basis pleadings or assumed facts. And and we say these observations demonstrate that one the court should not proceed to give summary judgment unless it can be said with confidence that on the assumed facts the claim is absolutely hopeless. And if we go on to paragraph 71 of Bacon on page 122, where the judge says this, there's one final point which favours the dismissal of the appeal, as I have endeavoured to show claims based on the duty of care and circumstances where the damage has been caused by a third party are currently at the forefront of the development of the law of negligence. Alleged duty in this case can certainly be regarded as being on the edge of that development, but in such circumstances I agree with the judge that following the principle in Barrett and Vedanta, it would be inappropriate to strike out the claim based on the alleged duty of care on assumptions in the absence of any findings of fact. 
and then paragraph 116 on page 131. For the reasons set out, I consider the duty of care alleged in this case, although faced with formidable hurdles, cannot be dismissed as fanciful. It survives CPR 0.4, Rule 24 2 test, and to the extent that it's close to the borderline, I consider that because it's an unusual argument in a rapidly developing area of law, it would also be wrong in principle to strike it out at this stage. And that passage is irreconcilable with the suggestion that the only <coughs> of the complexity or developing nature is whether or not the test has real prospects. Whether or not the test has real prospects. So that makes it clear that reasons why the test is met. And in case I misspoke, that we said the authorities make it clear that novel and controversial areas which include development of existing principles to new situations should not be decided on the basis of any assumed facts, even facts assumed in, in, in the claimant's favour. And that's clear from Bacon and Vedanta. Vedanta, paragraph 48 in the Supreme Court that I've already taken you to. I think for completeness you ought to see Vedanta in the Court of Appeal, which is tab 15, which I I think it's probably the beginning of bundle two in hard copy, and it's page 563. Give me the reference again, please. It's tab 15, page 563. <clears throat> An initial question arises how the court should approach an issue of law and the underlying litigation, which may be fundamental to the court's jurisdiction. Then refers to Altimo and the Privy Council, at paragraph 60, 61, and 62. And we pick it up at 63 as conclusion. In my judgment, this analysis leads to the following conclusion. In general, a real issue between the relevant parties is to be equated with a properly argued case or serious question to be tried. Where the argument or question goes to existence of jurisdiction should be decided if the facts are clear. However, uh, if the facts are not clear or the point of law is exceptionally difficult and doubtful, the test should remain that set out in one above. The law, this leaves open the question of the extent to which the facts are clear and what amounts to exceptionally difficult and doubtful points of law. As to the former point, the observation in Ultimo suggests the court should proceed on the basis of the case. So far as the latter point is concerned, it might be thought the more doubtful the point of law, the more cautious should, the court should be since the question of law goes to existence of jurisdiction. So that, we, that observation, to my mind at any rate, suggests that the court should assume the facts in your favour. As Lord Justice Simon says, the court should proceed on the basis of a pleaded case. So if on your pleaded case you are bound to fail, it surely can't help you to say, well, something else might get to the evidence. Yes, uh, I think I have to accept that. If, if you assume all facts in yes. my favour and it's obvious my case is going to fail, I can't, I can't say you should let me serve out just in case something turns up. I agree. I agree with that. And we say that the judge misunderstood the approach to be taken. First of all, at 40 to 45, she refers to Altima. You find that C13, page 148. So 41, she refers to Altima. And then cites some Lord Collins. Yep. And then at 43, she appears to accept correctly the, con 
complexity and novelty of a point of law is relevant to summary determination of a point of much questions jurisdiction. And then at 129 to 30 on page 167. She refers to Begum, Barrett and British Airways under the heading of policy considerations. And at 131, she makes what we say a slightly curious point that Barrett and Farrah concerned applications to strike out and, uh, and that Begum, Begum concerned a claim for striking out a reverse summary judgment None of them address service out of the jurisdiction, but as I've already taken you to, the test is the same. Then at 132 to 3, she, at 132, she refers to the policy considerations that we relied on, and at 133, she seems to accept that important points of policy are raised, that the matters are controversial and difficult. And of course, accept that important issues are raised about the recourse that Bitcoin owners had if private keys are lost, and the fact that issues of policy raised cannot provide a foundation for existence of duty for which I cannot see a realistically arguable case under existing law, even assuming that the facts all decided and details favoured, particularly cannot be the case that the fact that the matters raised are controversial or difficult is that it's sufficient of itself to justify the grant of permission if it's apparent there's no serious issue to be tried under existing law. Whilst the test of real possible success is not a high one, it does exist to ensure that foreign litigants are not subject to proceedings which the defendant would be entitled to have summarily dismissed. And at 134, the judge says the guides provided for Altima and Vedanta underlines the need for caution in cases where jurisdiction is in issue. And we say that's to misinterpret what these cases have been saying. As we've seen already, from Ultima paragraph 82, it's clear that the serious issue to be tried test is the same as the test summary judgment. So Bacon, British Airways and Barrett all are direct re relevant. If novelty and complexity is relevant to the summary judgment test, it's necessary and relevant to the question of real, prospects of real prospects of success in this case. However, the judge appears here to have thought that she should have exercised more caution as being more cautious than those authorities. And if that's the right interpretation of what she's done, uh, that's a misunderstanding of the position. And we, putting that to one side, we say for the remainder of 133 and 134 that the judge did misunderstand the correct test. The, the error being that the judge failed to appreciate that the complexity in the developing and the developing nature of the claim is one reason why there is a serious issue, rather than, as she's believed to be the case, and as the respondents would have it, that it's the fact that it's relevant to that test. And that can be seen from paragraph 133, which I've already shown you, where she says, it cannot be the case that the fact that the matters raised are controversial or difficult is sufficient to justify the grant of permission. And here the judge is wrongly divorcing the complexity from the issue of serious question. And likewise, at 134, she says, the threshold test on the merits remains that a serious question to be tried. It's not lower than that, and in particular doesn't permit service out in cases which don't meet that threshold. And that in involves two errors, we say. First, the judge thought it was being argued that the test should be lowered as a result of the complexity. That wasn't our Secondly, the point has already been made, it's wrong in principle to divorce novelty and complexity from the question of whether there's a serious question to be tried. Now, the paragraphs 15 and 16 of the original respondent's skeleton, I think we need to look it up, it's suggested that TTL's complaint is that the judge unjustifiably subjected TTL's case to a higher standard of proof. That's wrong. Our case is that the judge incorrectly failed to take into account the complexity and the developing nature of the claim as being one reason why the test was met. And it's important to take a step back here. The serious issue test is whether there's a real 
prospect of success where a point is complex, developing and involves policy considerations, it's obviously much harder to say that it's fanciful that the claim will succeed, and all the more so where it depends on heavily disputed facts. Doubtless in recognition of the fact that the judge's analysis were flawed and the complexity and novelty means that the appeal must succeed, the respondents now take an extremely surprising stance by asserting the present case is not one that's complex, difficult, or in a developing area of law. And we can see that from their skeleton argument in the core bundle at tab 8. First of all, at page 105. where they say at D that we've overstated the importance of the case and that are more important and better grounded issues to be addressed in the development of blockchain and digital asset regulation, not least those being considered presently by the Law Commission. And then we can go on to, to paragraph 12 on page 107. where they say that our claim that the relevant questions arise in the fast developing uncertain controversial area of law which raises important and difficult policy issues is irrelevant and betrays the superficiality of the PTR's analysis. So they seem to be saying that whilst disputes concerning legal developments around Bitcoin and digital assets are developing uncertain controversial and raise important issues, this case doesn't. That proposition is unsustainable. The question is that we raise in this action is fundamental to the question of how digital assets are held and dealt with. But from our earlier exchanges, it doesn't sound to me as though you would seriously disagree with the penultimate sentence of paragraph 12 of the respondent's skeleton argument. The present claim concerns whether well developed legal principles encapsulate a novel set of facts. Yes, but as you've seen from the well-developed legal principles, the, when you're looking to ask, when you're answering the question of whether or not a new, an ad hoc situation gives rise to fiduciary duties, it's very fact-specific. Yeah, no, I understand yes. that, but uh, as a characterisation of the nature of the claim being made, you that think, last, you, think you did accept I did. that the principles are well-established. The question is... How do they accommodate themselves, if they do, to a new set of facts? Yes, I d absolutely. But the point I'm dealing with is they're trying to, they're arguing here that we've overstated the importance yeah. of the case. And that was the point I was addressing. I wasn't seeking to go back on to our, to our earlier discussion. And it, we just say it's just not open to them to, to say that this case isn't important in the way we suggest. Uh, and its importance lies in this. We are effectively arguing that the question of accepted categories of fiduciary should be extended to developers who control Bitcoin networks. And if we're right about that, in future, the courts will proceed on the basis that they do owe fiduciary duties. It's not just a one-off claim that we're bringing. It's a, we're arguing that they are fiduciary. And on the question of importance, it's not open to them to, to gainsay that. The judgment, I've already taken to the judgment of paragraphs 132 to 134. There's no challenge to what the judge says there. And similarly, I've taken you to paragraph 66 on page 154. Yeah. Where she the learning judge refers to it being a controversial and developing area. Uh, the fact that there is a serious academic dispute just reinforces that the area of law it is one that hasn't been addressed before and it isn't without difficulty. Now, 
when giving permission to appeal, Lady Justice Andrews rightly thought, which we see at page 204, tab 17, she rightly was of the view that the case gave rise to issues of considerable importance and, and was rightly characterised as a matter of some complexity and difficulty. Uh, and the, the, the position that, the point that the position now taken by the respondents is wrong is also supported by the following statement issued by my learned friend for the primary respondent on his website where he says this is a hugely significant decision. The court has reached a clear view on this emerging and important point of law. So we're, it's not open to them now to resile from the judge's finding that this case gives rise to issues of real importance. I don't think you're going to get much help from what's on your opponent's website. No. Okay. Well, I move on. So we say... This is the first occasion in which the duties of software developers have been considered. We say it's a point of immense importance. We say it's a, clearly a point of complexity and part of the developing area of law. And that's reflected not just in the academic literature, but also in the fact that duties of digital currency developers have never been considered by a court in this jurisdiction or elsewhere. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, what we're effectively contending is that there should be a new status, new category of status-based fiduciary. A, sh a short point by... I leave ground one. The respondents say in paragraph 20 of their skeleton that we've sought, or they criticise us for it, it, for saying there'll be need to be an interrogation of their worldview of digital assets, uh, and they say that we've sought to import the question of decentralisation. I don't think I need to show you the reference, but in their first instance skeleton, they place great weight on the fact that our approach undermined the principles of decentralization, anonymity and security, which is violated by the Bitcoin user community. Would you give me just two seconds? I move on to ground three, which is judge was wrong to take account of the Law Commission project on digital assets. And the reference to that is at paragraph 135 of the judgment on page 169. judge says this, finally on the question of policy control considerations, I note that the Law Commission are currently undertaking a project on digital assets. Their interim update published on 24th November indicates that the scope of the project has been expanded and the principal areas to consider include both competing claims in relation to digital assets and how legal remedies or actions can protect digital assets. Whether the law should be developed in a way that would address all or part of TPL's case is no doubt something that could be considered by the Law Commission and, if appropriate, Parliament. Uh, we say that that's contrary to the approach in the authorities that we've looked at, and it's also flawed for three reasons. First, even if the law could be considered by the Law Commission, that would be of no present use to TTL and, and, and does, not, does not therefore provide a reason to fail to consider the proper policy context. Secondly, the judge appeared to have proceeded on the basis that the potential for legislation meant that this was a reason for her to conclude that there was no serious question to be tried. We say that's a plainly incorrect way of, for so deciding. 
judge wasn't being addressed on the meaning of a statute, instead she's being asked to consider whether as a matter of equity or under the common law the duties exist given the facts that exist. The possibility of legislation being introduced says nothing about what the duties already are. As is obvious, there will be ob often examples of legislation that codify the existing position of common law or equity. The example is a legion. In, in other words, the mere fact that there might be legislation in the future says nothing about the existing, the pre-existing condition. Thirdly, because rather than suggesting the existence of the project provided more reason to set aside the service side order, the existence of the project might suggest to the court that it ought to be, have less reason to do so on the basis that it supports the proposition that this is a developing area of law. If the Law Commission required a pro project to consider these matters, and how can it be said that TTL's arguments should be dismissed without anything more? It is in any case now borne out by the Law Commission report itself, which we find in the second volume of the authority bundle at tab 30, page 1000. And 16, page, paragraph 1640 of the report refers to the judgment in this case. Or rather, 1639 refers to the case. And 1640, it said the case suggests that developers in these circumstances cannot be regarded as having been entrusted with objects of property rights for the purpose of establishing by judiciary obligations and tortious liability. And this demonstrates that the Law Commission is proceeding on the basis of the com common law and equity to determine what the duties are rather than statute. Nor is there any proper consideration of the matters presently in issue by the Law Commission as the respondents accept as their skeleton paragraph 16, which relies on the fact that the Law Commission is now considering other issues uh, uh, rather than the issues in the present case. And what do the respondents say about this? First of all, there's an attempt to play down this point. D14 says, we don't need to look it up, at paragraph 38 of the skeleton, that's tab 26, page 269, that the point is peripheral, and the original respondents in their skeleton say that this was merely one factor among many, and an ancillary one at that. That's paragraph 33 for your note, that's core bundle, tab 8, page 112. That's not right, <coughs> they say. The judge specifically mentioned the Law Commission report in her N460. That's core, tab 14, page 179. The penultimate point she makes there, entitled to make point about Law Commission and also have regard to requirement for loyalty. And in her judgment on the hand down, she says this, that's the additional authorities, tab 11, page 369. She says this is paragraph 22. A criticism made about my reference to the Law Commission relates to a point that I believe I was fully really entitled to make. I also disagree with, my, with the criticism of my analysis in relation to loyalty. So we say it's clear that the judge didn't think the point she was making about the Law Commission was ancillary or peripheral. She did not say that she would have reached her decision regardless, as she could have done. And instead, she made it clear that she considered it as a relevant point that she had taken into account. The second point made by the original respondents about this the skeleton at 31, that's core 8111, is to say that the report is relevant to whether a duty of care exists. That, however, is no answer, e even if they're right about that. The judge is making the point generally, including in relation to fighter issue duties. A and the respondents do not suggest that the report could be relevant to that issue. In any case, the point is ill-founded. Reference is made by the original respondents to Kapara and Dickman and the relevance of what's fair, just, and reasonable. But that doesn't suggest that the decision as to what is fair is abrogated the Law Commission. They then rely on Wainwright and, and, 
and home office, we say that that, that reliance is misplaced. Uh, I'll come back to this and reply if necessary. But in summary, that was a case concerning claims of breach of privacy related to strip search. And the paragraph relied on deal with the question of construing statute in accordance with the ECHR. And they're of no relevance here. So for we say that whether alone or in combination with other grounds, this ground shows that the judge's decision cannot stand. And then now coming back to ground four, the particular errors which we say the judge made in her analysis. And we've identified these under seven grounds, 4A through to G. And I propose taking 4G in balance the power which I've already touched on when setting out our positive case, and ground 4A, fluctuating identity of developers first, as these concern the circumstances in which fiduciary duties are imposed. I then intend to move on to grounds 4B, C and D, which in one way or another each concern conflicting duties. And finally, I'll address grounds 4E and F, both of which concern how a fiduciary might be expected to comply with his duties in practice. Now, I can deal with ground 4G first, which you'll note we deal with in our skeleton argument at paragraph 61. That's page 74 of the core bundle, tab 6. And we said that the judge failed to give sufficient weight to the imbalance of power. And the focus is, should be on both paragraph 73 and 76 of the judgment, if we can go to 73 first of all, tab 13, page 155. And what we say here is that the judge in 73 does not appear to have appreciated that an imbalance, an imbalance of power, together with vulnerability to abuse of that power, is precisely the factual scenario that objectively gives rise to a legitimate expectation by a principle that the fiduciary will act in his best interest, as explained in the authorities that I've already taken you to. As we've seen, it's at that legitimate expectation that equity recognise and acts upon by imposing fiduciary duties. And we do, say do you say the judge was wrong when she said it's not a sufficient condition for the existence of the duty? Yeah. So an imbalance of power is sufficient? It's the, it is the rationale for imposing fiduciary duties. In some cases? Yeah. Well, we say in this particular case. I mean, if I'm a farmer yeah. trying to sell my produce to a supermarket, and they say, well, we're not going to pay the prices you demand. Well, it's not going to contract with you at all. Well, there's no role yeah. being undertaken by the supermarket, so the right. point doesn't arise. Yeah. There's, got, it's, there's got to be a role undertaken yeah. which puts the other party at the mercy of the person undertaking that role. And if you have that imbalance of power mm. where you are at the mercy of the person undertaking the role, we say that is the rationale for the imposition of fiduciary duty. And so what we say, we do say the judge, learned judge was wrong when she says it may in broad terms be a rationale. We say it's absolutely the rationale. So is, is it possible to have circumstances in which there is an imbalance of power, but there wouldn't be a legitimate expectation of an undivided duty of loyalty? Mm. Can I think about that and come back to you? Because if so, it, it can't be a sufficient condition. No, if, if one can postulate, if one can hypothesise a situation where there is a role undertaking, undertaken, which gives rise to imbalance of power so that the other party is at the mercy, but the court says no fiduciary duty owed, then yes, but well, I'm not aware of any such case. If I get on a train or an aeroplane, I'm, I'm at the mercy of the carrier. No, you're not. You've got a contract. We're not a contractual position, situation, as I said earlier this morning, give rise to different considerations. You have, we're dealing here with a contractual situation where someone has undertaken a specific role in respect of 
someone else's asset, whereby that other person's assets are at the mercy of the person undertaking the role. And I'm not aware of any case not involving contract where no fiduciary duty has been held to be owed. Stand corrected by my learned friends. So that's why we say it is the rationale. That's why equity intervenes. And, you, and if I may say so, you can't attack that proposition by looking at a contractual case. It was in those circumstances, if I've entrusted my assets to someone in circumstances where I am at that person's complete mercy, I do have a legitimate expectation that he will act in my best interest. He will not run off with those assets or otherwise abuse them. That's at, at the heart. I'm just of slightly it. puzzled. I mean, you, you, you've shown us what Justice Mason said in the hospital products case. Yeah. Um, and he makes it quite clear that fiduciary duties are moulded by contract. But in answer to my lord, you said, well, no, if you've got a contract, then you, that's, that, your remedies are in contract. Well, I don't think there's the the a dichotomy between contract cases and non-contract cases. This isn't quite as stark as you're suggesting, is it? Well, fine issue to, I thought he said my fine issue to are moulded by the yes. circumstances. And the circumstances, I, yes, I of course accept it, that it's limited circumstances where there is a contract that can be fine issue to his own. Well, a solicitor is an obvious example. Yeah. Yes, and what, what he said was moulded according to the nature of the relationship and the facts of the case. I don't think he said contract. And I take you back, if I need to, to the Kent case, where Lord Justice Leggett specifically said different considerations apply where there is a contract. So does a police officer owe me my douchery duties when I'm arrested? No, I don't think he does. But you answer. haven't entrusted. You haven't trusted. You haven't entrusted assets to him where, in circumstances where he's undertaking a role where you're complete mercy. Well, uh, there's an imbalance of power. I, his statutory rights mean that my person is in his custody. Well, I, I don't see the analogy myself. I don't see that's a good analogy where we're talking about someone undertaking a role. The police officers. Have, have particular powers that they're entitled to exercise, both at common law and under statute. Well, all, all I'm seeking to test is, is, is the, your criticism of the judge's conclusion that imbalance of power is not always a sufficient condition. And I, I may not have picked particularly good examples, but um, instinctively, I feel there must be many cases where there's an imbalance of power. Well, the police officer. Fiduciary duty. They may not be analogous to this case. Well, the police officer isn't undertaking any responsibility for your assets, is he? It's, it's, not, it's not to say you've gone to the police station. So let's, let's put, make it a clearer analogy. You go to the police station because you're, you're concerned that your property is under threat by, I don't know, your neighbours or whatever, and you give your property to the police for safekeeping. In those circumstances, we would say, yes, by duty your obligations are owed. Does a bailee normally have fiduciary obligations? I pass. Think about that. But I, 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 if I may respectfully say so, I don't think just asking questions is when, does the fact that the police officer has power over you when arresting, I don't I really think that it is, uh, bites on the propositions that we need to consider here. I think if, if I can to see if I've got your formulation right, because it's been developing a bit. I think you, you say, tell me if I've got this right, that a fiduciary, ob, fiduciary obligations <coughs> will arise where A, voluntarily undertakes a role without contract, affecting B's property with an imbalance of power vis-a-vis -vis B. Yes. Which, re which results in B being at the mercy of A. Right. So, th so, that, so that the relationship is open to abuse. 
And that's what we get out of the various authorities I've taken. finish off that first point, almost finish off that first point, the judge referred to Snell's equity in 73 of her judgment. You can see from the footnote 2 at the bottom of the page. Can we just have a look at that? that you'll find authorities tab 28, page 985. Seven zero one. Separately from the actual documents that modify existing rights of property in the interest of justice, equity also provides protection against the inappropriate use of the position of superiority held over another person. One of the fundamental ways in which courts of equity provide this sort of protection is through the actual documents, documents applied to persons who are recognised as fiduciaries in their relationship. And the judge's, what we say, the judge's error of approach in paragraph 73 led her to make a statement of her judgment that requires qualification. And we can look at paragraph 76 on page 156. She said there... obligation of undivided loyalty is the distinguishing feature or defining characteristic of a fiduciary relationship. However, whilst the obligation of undivided loyalty is certainly the core defining or distinguishing obligation of a fiduciary, it's not the defining characteristic. The distinguished, the factual scenario that gives rise to a fiduciary relationship is that the fiduciary has a special opportunity to exercise power or discretion over his principle in a way that affects the principal's interest in a legal or practical sense, such that the principal is at the mercy of the fiduciary. And we say that that is the situation that applies between the respondent and TTL. Yeah. And the core criticism of this ground put forward by the original <coughs> respondents, perhaps you ought to look at this, it's the core bundle, tab 8, page 18. So I do apologise, I misspoke, tab 8, page 118. And they say that um, we're able only to, to um, when you refer to New Zealand and Australian authority. But we respond to that, that not only a Commonwealth case is clearly relevant authority for this court to consider, but the passage to which we refer, to which we refer in the hospital products case, identifying as fiduciary special opportunity to exercise power or discretion to the detriment of his principle. That's been repeatedly approved by the English High Court, including in Alma, Nehan and Kent. And the original respondents also cite in this paragraph a passage from the judgment of Chief Justice Gibbs in Hospital Products, which we find in tab 10 of the authorities, page 344. Well, the bottom of the page says this. Another circumstance in which it sometimes suggested indicates existence of fiduciary relationships, inequality of bargaining power. 
It's clear that such inequality alone is not enough to create a studious relationship in every case. Now, the judge didn't explain why he considered his statement to be clear. Secondly, that observation hasn't been considered by the English courts. But more importantly, thirdly, it doesn't conflict with the well-known observations of Mr. Justice Mason, as the respondents implied. Imbalance of power may not, may not always give rise to a, a legitimate expectation between the purported fiduciary because the purpose, sorry, I rephrase that, may not always give rise to a legitimate expectation because the purported fiduciary must also have a special opportunity to use his power to the detriment of his principle, such that the principle is at the fiduciary's mercy. This is, this is why a contractual party is in a more advantageous position than his, sorry, this is why a contractual party in a more advantageous position than his counterparty doesn't owe fiduciary obligations to his counterparty in respect to the performance of the contractual obligation. And we say, I've already made this point, but I'll repeat it, the respondents do have a special opportunity here to exercise power in respect of TTL. And that being so, there's nothing to the respondents' point. And the judge's apparent failure to appreciate that an imbalance of power together with vulnerability to abuse of that power is what founds a fiduciary relationship, clearly influenced her decision to reject TTL's case on fiduciary duty. And the reason I say this is because in her discussion at paragraph 72 through to 83, she doesn't give any sufficient, or doesn't appear to give any weight, or certainly not sufficient weight, to TTL's factual claims about the power the respondents have to affect its interests. And I would ask you to, I don't think we need to go through that section again. Paragraph 72 starts. But what she's doing here <clears throat> is not so much asking in the abstract, could software developers of this particular program have some sort of fiduciary duties to Bitcoin owners, but whether duties go as far as you say they should go. And that's really what she's focusing on in 75. I accept that they're two different questions. Yeah. But you have to answer the second, having first answered the first. You have to ask, are the fiduciary duties owed? If the answer to that is no, well, that's the end of the story. Quite. If the answer is yes, do the fiduciary duties go this far? Yeah. But she's wrapped up the two questions as one. And that's the error. So you say she was wrong to treat together the existence of fiduciary duties and the scope of fiduciary, du fiduciary duties if they exist? Absolutely. Because um, you'll see from most of her discussion, she ended up discussing it by reference to the particular claim being brought by this claimant. But that can't answer the question of whether or not fiduciary duties are owed. And you remember I took you to that passage of paragraph 99, where she seemed to envisage that in certain circumstances duties might be owed if there was a malicious introduction of software whereby they ran off with a digital asset. But that doesn't help you, does it? I mean, you're not bringing this claim simply to establish <coughs> there are some kind of fiduciary duties which software developers owe to Bitcoin owners, you want access to your particular Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the whole point of the action. Yes, so, but it's still two questions. Well, I follow that, but, it, but if, if the answer is, well, even if there are fiduciary duties, they don't go as far as you say they go, and it's not arguable that they do, well, then, I'm, then, then, I'm, then, then you then, lose. Well, I've had it. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. But 
Not from a moment conceding. No, no, I follow yeah, that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, essentially, you're, you're saying there are two questions. And I, there are two I, questions. I see that. I yeah, see that. The two questions. And all, 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 all I was really saying that actually, when addressing it, she failed to distinguish between those two questions and actually uh, sought to answer the prior question by reference to, to what would be the scope of the duties if they were yeah. were owed. And that actually is an error of analysis. Moving on to fluctuating identity of developers, that's for your note, our skeleton, paragraph 635 through to 40, that's C6, pages 68 to 69. Uh, and we said the wrong judge was wrong to conclude that the respondents cannot owe fiduciary duties to TTL, because those individuals who control the software governing the operation of the networks are a fluctuating and unidentified body or a fluctuating body of individuals, as the judge put it, 73 and 75 for judgment. 73 you can find at page 155 of C13. Which says this. Foundation of our case is the alleged imbalance of power combined with entrustment of property, whilst an imbalance of power is often a feature, the main rule to ask a rationale, we've already looked, looked at that. Further, to the extent relevant, I don't think that Bitcoin owners can realistically be described as entrusting their property to a fluctuating and un unidentified body of developers, at least in the sense of the extent claimed by TTL. Then at 75, last four lines, but developers are a fluctuating body of individuals as a general proposition it cannot realistically be argued that there are continuing obligations to, for example, remain as developers and make future updates whenever it might be in the interest of owners to do so. Uh, and we say, with respect, that the judge's analysis is fundamentally wrong. That this is the case can be seen very straightforwardly from the fact that by her analysis that the trustee wouldn't do fiduciary duties because it's the identity of trustees will trust fluctuate from time to time. A statement at 73 suggests she erroneously considered the question of whether a relationship of trust exists between a fiduciary and principles depended upon the nature and longevity of their relationship. But as I've already explained, a person becomes subject to fiduciary duties because of the role he chooses to undertake in relation to his principles and the power that that role allows him to exert in respect to the principal's interest. And if someone chooses to undertake a role that gives rise to a legitimate expectation about how he'll perform that role, such that the fiduciary duties fall to be imposed on him, the expectation will arise and the fiduciary duties will be imposed as soon as he undertakes that role, and irrespective of whether his identity is known to his principal. In short, the law doesn't require someone to undertake a right, uh, uh, the role for a minimum length of time before becoming a fiduciary, uh, nor for the principal to know the identity of the fiduciary before duties are owed. And, and neither the judge nor the respondents have pointed to any authority to support such proposition. In the same vein, fiduciary obligations fall away once the re relevant relationship giving rise to them comes to an end, and that's the unsuspecting dictum of the Court of Appeal in Attorney General and Blake, which you find at tab 4 of volume 1 at page 77. And at just above 8, we're unable to accept the last two propositions. We don't recognise the concept of a fiduciary obligation which continues notwithstanding the determination of the particular relationship which gives rise to it. I'm sorry, Mr. Ward, I missed a page I'm just going to apologise. It's page 77, and I was looking just at the passage starting just above H. Mm -hmm. Second sentence, we don't recognise the concept of a fiduciary obligation which continues notwithstanding the determination of the particular relationship which gives rise to it. Equity doesn't demand a duty of undertime provided loyalty from a former employee. And it's therefore wholly unsurprising that in Letty, Markey and Cooper, 
which we cite in our skeleton argument, the court was not concerned by the ever-fluctuating nature of charitable guarantee companies' membership while holding that those members owe fiduciary duties for the charitable purposes of the company. And we get that at Authorities Bundle 14. For your note, the whole passage from 78 to 105 are worth reading, but I'll just draw your attention in particular to paragraphs 105, 200, 205, and 236. And we say it's trite law that directors of any companies whose identities are, identities are plainly not fixed owe fiduciary duties to the company during their respective periods of office, irrespective of the length of those periods in office. As such, the judge was correct to observe at paragraph 75, page 156, at the end of that paragraph, the general proposition that cannot realistically be argued they are continuing obligations to remain as developers and make future updates whenever it might be in the interest of owners to do so. Uh, but our case isn't that, never was that. The, duties are only owed while you're acting in that role. And if you leave that role before the alleged breach of duty, you can't be brought back. You can't bring a former director back and say, you must now, now perform the duties that you, you once owned. And it's never been our case that that was the position. So in short, the question of whether they're liable determined by reference to the role that they were undertaking at the time of the alleged breach. And therefore, if they relinquish their role since their assistance was, was sought and they unconditionally refused to provide at that stage, uh, they would then be liable. But if they've left before the alleged breach, before their assistance was, was requested, there's clearly no liability. And the respondent's response to this ground which can be found at 34 to 36, core tab 8, page 112, we say shows a fundamental misunderstanding of when and why fiduciary duties are owed. And they put forward a series of propositions from paragraph 35 onwards. And we say these propositions are not supported by authority and are not part of the approach of determining whether ad hoc fiduciary duties should be imposed as per Mosu, lack minerals and hospital products. And more particularly, looking at the third, fourth and fifth sentences of 35, equity doesn't require someone to undertake a role with a charitable purpose vis-a-vis -vis another for him to owe fiduciary duties. Secondly, the penultimate sentence of the main body of 35, and the paragraph, subparagraph A of 35. There was no requirement for the fiduciary to give it her and his informed consent to, or knowingly or formally assume fiduciary duties imposed upon him by equity. And as the judge correctly noted in paragraph 60 of her judgment, we've already looked at, where she cited for Vendor and FNC alternative investments, the existence of duties is not dependent on a subjective or voluntary assumption of them, but is a consequence of the nature of the role assumed or task undertaken, objectively determined. All a fiduciary is required to have done is to have voluntarily undertaken a role that the law seems deems to attract fiduciary duties. And that's strongly supported by another Supreme Court decision, the Supreme Court of New Zealand, in Chernside and Fay. And we find that in Authorities Bundles, tab 6, page 118, it starts. And it starts at 118, we can pick it up at 144. And Paragraph 75, 
Court says the second situation in which a relationship can be classed as fiduciary depends not on the inherent nature of the relationship, on, upon an examination of whether its particular aspects justify it being so called. No single formula or test has received universal acceptance in deciding whether a relationship outside the recognised categories is such as the part of each other obligations of a fiduciary kind. The literature in this field is voluminous. They don't consider a survey. If we can then go on to paragraph 79. So this is Justice Tipping and Blanchard. Blanchard. Yeah. Um, is this a majority judgment? Do the others agree with it? Yes, the, the judge, I've forgotten his name, I'm terribly sorry. I'll check. Certainly another judge agrees with them. It is the, it's, uh, as I understand, it is the majority. I will double check that over the short term. Yeah. Rather than. Yeah, well, that's 75. The next one where you wanted was 79. 79. 79. I'm told that most of it is unanimous, there's a small part that isn't, but... Mr Justice Gold supports what they say. 79. The reference to interest of the principle was appropriate in the context of that case, but the concept is a general application. A little later, the Lordship to rely on Matthew. His Lordship had there focused on the need for circumstances to give rise to a relationship of trust and confidence. This observation was linked to the idea that a fiduciary was someone who had undertaken to act for or on behalf of another, a point to which we will have occasion to refer again. Below, it's clear from the authorities that relationships which are inherently fiduciary all possess a feature which justifies the imposition of fiduciary duties in a case which fall outside the traditional category. All fiduciary relationships, whether inherent or particular, are marked by the entitlement of one party to place trust and confidence rendered in our close and legitimate expectation. The party is entitled to rely on the other party not to act in a way which is contrary to the first party's interests. There can be little doubt that at least prima facie the relationship between Mr. Chernside and Mr. Fay was such that Mr. Fay was entitled to oppose and did oppose trust and confidence. On that basis, we turn to address Mr. Whiteside's submission that no fiduciary element arose in particular circumstances between his client and Fay in summary was that the appropriate test that Mr. whether Mr. Chernside was under fiduciary obligation was whether Mr. Chernside had undertaken or agreed to act for on behalf of Mr. Fay's interest. Council's proposed test isn't a correct statement of the law, it has a strong contractual flavour which doesn't properly reflect the approach of equity. This contractual flavour was heightened by Mr. Whiteside's further submission that the necessary undertaking or agreement had to be expressed and couldn't be applied. The simple answer to this submission is equity plays an obligation to stew self-interest when the circumstances require. The obligation doesn't arise only when expressly undertaken. To hold otherwise would confine the powers of equity to situations akin to express trust and deedship and would emasculate the breadth of equities that have been reached by abusive concepts such as constructive trusteeship. And if we can go on to 84 to 85 over the page. See Whiteside, Mr. Whiteside at 84 cited from Ost Mason's judgment, and the conclusion is Mr. W at 85, Mr. Whiteside sought to build out of his passage the for proposition that the form of fiduciary duties can arise in an express undertaking or agreement over the page was an argument. No basis to conclude from the passages cited that the judges involved were intended to confine fiduciary relationships to express case of express undertaking or agreement, nor were the judges. Best to lay down a mandatory agreement to the fiduciary relationship as an express undertaking. At the very least, the undertaking can be implicit. In our view, the true principle in our view resides in the idea that circumstances must be such that one party is entitled to oppose and does propose, propose trust and confidence in the other. So, in, in passing, I note that on this point, the, the respondents impermissibly asked the court to rely on their factual account of how the software governing the networks is approved, which isn't appropriate on a summary determination. They do this in a bid to give the impression that the respondents have less control of the code governing the networks than they do. That factual account is wrong, as was made clear by our evidence. I'm not proposing to take you in the time available to our evidence, but we, our evidence was that the particular developers we have sued are the people who control the networks. And you have no 
that in the case of D14, he is the only one. And going back to my learned friend Skeller's argument at page 112, uh, subparagraph B actually doesn't require a fiduciary to know the precise identity of his principles or how many of them there are in the class of persons. Subparagraph C, a fiduciary does, doesn't escape his duties because his principal cannot choose his identity. Subparagraph D, it doesn't matter how many fiduciaries owe the same duties to the same principal. Subparagraph E, doesn't matter that the defendants are spread across the globe. But can I just ask you about that? Um, if you've got a developer who happens to be resident in, say, Germany, yeah. and a Bitcoin owner who is, say, resident in Japan, is it all still governed by English law? Well, I think that raises an interesting and difficult question. I think for today, one has to assume that it's governed by English law, because it's, it, it, the contrary is an obvious one. Yeah. And, and we say it's governed by English law because TTL is resident in England and its assets are situated in England. Well, I, I follow, but does that mean that the developers might owe different obligations to different people depending on where either they are located or the Bitcoin owners are located? I, I, I don't think I can go there today. Right. I, I, think I, have to, I think the court, if I may say so, has to proceed on the basis that English law applies and we're looking at it from an English law perspective. And if the, all these developers are before the court on the face of it, that's how the court will, will proceed. And then F, what matters, as a matter of fact, I'll rephrase that, questions of what control they actually exert and whether that control is sufficient to give rise to high duty duties are clearly questions for trial to be determined after hearing factual and expert evidence. And paragraph 36 of my then friend Skeleton seems to proceed on the basis that someone needs to have undertaken a role that attracts high duty duties for a minimum period. We say that's wrong. And they then say, 36D, that the injunction we seek is likely to be ineffective because it will be frustrated by the actions of non-party developers. But as to that, the judge made it clear at 137 of our judgment, we don't need to look it up, that that issue formed no part of our case. And in any event, our case that we brought our claim against all the necessary developers. And thirdly, even if it were the case that there were other non-party developers in control of the networks who could frustrate the effect of the injunction, uh, there's a very real prospect they'd be held to be liable in contempt, and we re rely on Attorney General and Punch. In time available, I can't take, we're not going to take you to that, but I ask you to look at the judgments of Lord Nichols at paragraph 43, 47 to 49, 52 and 57, these are internal paragraph numbers in the judgment, per Lord Stain at 64, per Lord Hoffman at 66 and 125, and Lord Walker at 126, and for your note, that's the additional authorities bundle, tab 2, pages 75 through to 78, 80 and 96. I then turn to 4B, risk of conflicting duties, this is the first of three subgrounds dealing with the judge's errors in respect of issues of conflict. And we say, in respect of ground B, there's no proper basis for the judge's conclusion that there must be a real risk that acceding to GTL's demands would not be consistent with a single-minded loyalty owed to other users. That's paragraph 78 of the judgment at page 156. the last sentence of 78 over on page 157. Uh, and the short answer to this, if the respondents owe other users the same fiduciary duties as TTL contends, then there's no conflict. 
because the duty is contended for to take all reasonable steps to provide each, each owner with access to and control of that owner's assets, rather than allowing third party fraudsters to misappropriate those assets. As such, the duties owed to each owner will be in respect of different assets in each case. And if the respondents comply with their fiduciary duties to assess, assist TTL in regaining access to and control of its assets, their actions would have no impact on the ability of other users to access their assets and there would be no conflict. And let the original respondents' suggestion that they would find themselves owing fiduciary duties to various people claiming ownership is mis is misconceived. They will only ever owe the duties to the true owners. And secondly, the judge didn't conclude that the respondents owe or might owe users any fiduciary duties in respect of any other aspects of the relationship with them. So there were no other fiduciary duties that might conflict. And at paragraph 83 of her judgment, the judge expressly declined to, to conclude that the respondents owed or might owe fiduciary duties to other users to meet their alleged expectations regarding the use of private keys, proof of work process is an anonymity. So e even if the judge had found that there was a real risk of conflicting duties to which no consent had been obtained, uh, that conclusion would not be enough to prevent TTL meeting the low serious issue to be tried threshold. She would have had to have concluded that a conflict was effectively a certainty. And the second ground here is ground C, conflicting duties preclude the existence of fiduciary duties. We deal with that in our skeleton argument in paragraph 43 to 49. <coughs> That's at C, 6, 70 to 71. And when dealing with this at paragraph 78 of her judgment, the judge failed to consider whether users could have impliedly given their informed consent to any conflict. That's by the by, because it, uh, on our case, she didn't identify any conflicting duties. And she was wrong to conclude that there was a risk of conflicting duties. And she's wrong in any event to suggest that a real risk of conflict prevents it being a serious issue to be tried as the existence of fiduciary duties. But also we say the judge was clearly wrong on this. But we say there would clearly be an implied informed consent, or at the very least it cannot be said to be fanciful that it would be applied consent. In the interest of time, I therefore just ask you to reread paragraphs 44 to 49 of our skeleton argument on this subground. There cannot be a sensible dispute that a conflict doesn't prevent, doesn't preclude fiduciary duties arising, or that informed consent may be implied. And the classic example given is that of estate agents. And the judge simply didn't ask herself the question whether other users of the networks had consented and concluded impliedly to any potential or actual conflict. And we say, therefore, the weight the judge placed on conflicting duties. It's been misplaced. In, in any event, the question of implied consent is, at least in part, quintessentially a matter of fact. We say there must be implied consent if there are conflicting duties, uh, and our case is that all the users will be aware that there are other users, and so implied consent. Moving on to ground 4D, rival claimants. Our skeleton deals with this at paragraphs 50 through to 56. That's 4, 6, paragraph 71, pages 71 to 72. The judge expressed two concerns about rival claimants to TTL's digital assets, i.e. other persons purported to be owners of our assets. And both these, these, both these concerns were central to her conclusion that the respondents cannot possibly owe fiduciary duties to TTL. First, at paragraph <coughs> 76, which we've already looked at, she appears to have held that respondents couldn't owe the claim by duty to TTL and users generally to reunite them with their digital assets. Because by reuniting users with their assets, they could be disadvantaging rival claimants of those assets. 
that's the last sentence, paragraph 76. As a result, she thinks that the respondents wouldn't be able to fulfil their duty of undivided loyalty to each of their principles. Secondly, at paragraph 77, 1881, the judge expressed a related concern that rival claimants couldn't bring actions against the re respondents if they complied with the order TTLC. And this posed such a risk to the respondents that it prevented fiduciary duties being imposed. And we say the judge's analysis is wrong. If the respondents were ordered to assist TTL or another user in regaining access to their assets, it would be on the basis that TTL or that other user had been found to be the true owner. Accordingly, any rival claimants would be falsely claiming ownership of the relevant assets, and they wouldn't in reality be disadvantaged by the judgment. The respondents wouldn't owe any duties to disingenuous rival claimants, and therefore the respondents' ability to fulfil their duty of undivided loyalty to TTL and other true owners would not be compromised. And it's fanciful, we would submit, to suggest that disingenuous rival claimants would go to the trouble of bringing actions against the respondents when they couldn't prove ownership, and the court would then be hoodwinked into making an incorrect declaration. Is the judge right to say that what you're asking for is, as it were, a tailor-made patch for you, not a systemic well, the change? Both, both, are, both are possible, according to the evidence. So we went to dictate which, they which option they decide to adopt. So the, the software could be tweaked or altered to benefit TTL alone? Yes. But also be tweaked so to benefit all units, so that all, if any other user could find themselves in a position where their assets had been yeah. hacked and removed, they could be restored. And, and that was the evidence. And my lord, even if the court did make an erroneous declaration about ownership, and we say the court shouldn't proceed on the basis that this court makes incorrect declarations, any rival claimant who in fact has a true claim could seek to set aside that declaration and the substantive judgment founded upon it as an interested party under CPR 40.9. And if the respondents have complied with the original order made by this court, any subsequent claim by a rival claimant will be at best a breach of duty claim, because the respondents could never be criticised or held to be a breach of duty uh, by a claim from a, a rival claimant if they've adhered to an original or pre-existing English court order. Well, that's uh, looking at it through rather parochial eyes. I, I dare say in Orange County, one of the many Orange Counties in the United States, they might not take the same view. Yes, but there's no evidence about any views taken by in other jurisdictions, and I inevitably have to address it on the basis of English law. Well, you, you ask us to assume that there's no scope for a, a claim abroad for breach of duty in complying with an English court order. Uh, if the foreign court were to find that in fact true ownership was with somebody... Well, uh, who we, hadn't taken part in the English proceedings. I, I speak for myself, I don't feel very comfortable making that assumption. Well, the position on foreign law is a matter of expert evidence. Absent that, we have to assume English law is the same. But prior, um, if you start from English law, uh, a ben Ray Benjamin order allowing a personal representative to distribute assets when it's uncertain if a beneficiary is alive or not, that gives that personal representative defence, Beddoe's orders in respect to bringing litigation. On the face of it, it would be very surprising if a foreign jurisdiction <coughs> would turn round and say to the fiduciaries, even though you complied with an English court order, you are liable to a rival claimant. Well, if we're, if we're looking at it from an English court point of view, the relevant question is, what would the English court do if that had happened in a foreign jurisdiction? And I'm not sure the English court would automatically say just because you've got a declaration in uh, one of the United States of America in which the claimant who we found owns the assets uh, was not party to the proceedings and was not notified uh, about them, that we will uh, treat that as preclusive of a claim for breach of duty in, in handing over the assets. Apologies, I didn't mean to interrupt. It's very difficult to see how they could be held to be in breach of duty, of duty if they've, there's been an old court order 
they've complied with it, and only then someone else comes up out of the woodwork and says, uh, uh, I am the rival claimant. How can, uh, it's very difficult to hypothesize how, in those circumstances, the developers could be said to be in breach of duty to the, that other rival claimant. The, the, uh, the, the other rival claimant says what? Well, you, he asks them to give them access to his digital assets, and they say, well, the court has already declared that they belong to someone else, and we can no longer give access. Well, the rival claimant says they're mine. I knew nothing about these foreign proceedings. I want the court to say that they're mine, and my only remedy now is that you shouldn't have handed them over. Anyway, I, anyway, I, I understand I, your I've point. got your point, and I, I, and I, I, and I have your a better point. answer than the one I've given you. More importantly, I've got your point. Thank you. And with final postscript point is that fiduciary duties may find themselves subject to unjustified claims, and, and the theoretical risk of being subject to competing claims or unjustified claims is not a reason for not owing a fiduciary duty in the first place. A trustee can be subject to competing claims. No one would ever suggest that the trustee doesn't owe fiduciary duties because of that risk. The original responders make two additional points relating to rival claimants that I'll address very briefly for completeness. First, they focus on whether the judgment, any judgment would be in personam or in rem. We don't for a moment suggest it would be in rem, but we say that the fact that in personam doesn't matter because the rival claimants aren't a real concern. Secondly, they're wrong that any difficulty they have in ascertaining whether TTL is the true owner of assets prevents fiduciary duties being owed because the question of ownership is entirely separate to the question of whether fiduciary duties are owed to the true owner. And one need, need to keep the two separate questions separate. If the respondents are unsure about the user's ownership, they could require the user to obtain a declaration as to ownership as a condition of granting the roof sought. Here, we have sought a declaration and that the respondents have refused to provide the relief seat, whether or not the declaration is granted. They haven't said, yes, the declaration as to ownership is granted, we will, we will help. They've said, made it absolutely plain that they regard themselves under no obligation towards us, even if we establish we are the true owners. And in ground 4E, steps must be for benefit, TTL's benefit alone. And the judge in 76 for judgment referred to possibility of the software update that we request could be the disadvantage of other participants. I think I've already dealt with that. For, for our note, you'll find our points made at paragraph 57 of our skeleton at C6, page 73. And, and there is no requirement that steps taken by a fiduciary should be for the benefit of all these principles. A fiduciary is in, required to act in the best interest of any individual principle. But yeah, if, if the patch is tailor-made for TTL and yes. doesn't affect anybody. Yes. Difficult to see how that could be to anybody else's disadvantage except a putative rival claimant. I agree. <coughs> so that's round 4F. Duties can be positive. And the judge correctly observed at paragraph 82, page 157, that um, duties are proscriptive rather than prescriptive, as was held in the Attorney General in Blake. Basically, it was held that the doctrine tells the fiduciary what he mustn't do, doesn't tell him what he ought to do. But there seems to be some confusion about this. As we explain in paragraph 58 of our skeleton, the fiduciary is simply required to adhere to his core duty of undivided lo loyalty to his principle, in respect of whatever role, part of his role or task, he owes fiduciary duties. He's prohibited from being disloyal, which is why the duties have been called proscriptive. proscriptive. <coughs> However, there may be a number of ways in any particular instance in which a <coughs> fiduciary may ensure he's loyal and avoid being disloyal. And provided he remains loyal, the fiduciary can adopt any of them. And it's in that sense that fiduciary duties are not prescriptive. But of course, its law is clear that there may, may well be times where a fiduciary finds himself in a situation where there is, in reality, only one way in which he may act in order to 
that is called duty of loyalty. Such situations can be seen in the authorities to which we took the judge and she referred to in paragraph 82 of the fund judgment. Now, we haven't put any of these in, in the authorities bundle because she cites the relevant passages. So in both Fasihi and first sub C, it was held that the company director is in breach of his fiduciary duty of loyalty to the company directs by not self-supporting his own misconduct. And as Lady Justice Arden explained in the last sentence of Fasihi, a paragraph 44, the only way for a director to comply with his duty of loyalty is to take the positive step of reporting his own misconduct. And in Buller, the judge, parag uh, paragraph 41, referred to in the judgment, company directors were held to be in breach of their duty of loyalty to the company by not disclosing an acquisition opportunity to their co-directors and thereby the company before taking it for themselves. The only way to comply with their duty was to take the top positive step of disclosing the opportunity. And it was also notable in the Letty Marquis and Cooper that a member of a charitable company had been held to owe fiduciary duties to the charitable purpose of that company was actually required by the court to, to act positively by voting in favour of a resolution. Wouldn't the trustees of a fund have a duty at least to consider whether to invest it or not? Yeah. Possibly a duty to invest. Exactly. Exactly. And none of these cases say anything about there being a limit to the positive action that fiduciary can be required to fulfil its core duty of loyalty. And the respondents suggest paragraph 50, that the non-prescriptive nature of duties means that the respondents cannot owe fiduciary duties to take action that prevents ongoing harm, but that's inconsistent with the core duty of loyalty. And in this regard, they've mischaracterised sharp and blank, and I'll deal with that, if need be, by way of reply. All, all, all that, Mr Justice Nugy, as he then was said, he declined to decide whether fiduciaries can be required to undertake what he required as a positive duty to act in the best interest of their beneficiaries, while noting that trustees do appear to undertake such duties in practice. So, my lords, that's the rest of ground four. I was now going to move on to ground two. Would it be convenient to do that at two o'clock? Yes, it would. <laughs>